Have you ever felt the piercing sting of betrayal? I experienced it firsthand when my brother, upon his unexpected return, taunted me with, So what's up, little brother? I hear you married my girl. Even got a kid of your own now. Tell me, how did you do it? His words sowed seeds of doubt and pain in what I believed was a faithful relationship. The betrayal deepened when she confessed in a hushed voice, First, don't talk so loud or my mother and father will hear you. And second, I lied about Tommy Sheldon. Nobody's ever gotten me. I made it all up to make you mad. My journey of navigating through the labyrinth of deception and self-discovery starts here. This is my story. Enjoy watching it. Devin Buchanan observed the Starbucks cafe and spotted an old acquaintance, Michael Sullivan. Devin had been away for a while, and seeing Michael alone at a table caught his attention. He decided to approach him and catch up as they used to be close friends. As Devin made his way over, he noticed Michael's changed appearance. The once skinny and frail boy had transformed into a well-built individual who seemed to have been hitting the gym. Michael was dressed in attire that conveyed a sense of moderate sophistication, with a sport coat draped on his chair. Devin couldn't help but wonder if the rumors he had heard about Michael were true, that he was starting to find success. Upon reaching Michael's table, their eyes met. Michael's face lit up in recognition, expressing surprise at seeing Devin after what felt like an eternity. Devin took a seat, still wearing his coat, and began to catch up with Michael. The conversation touched on Michael's marriage to Celine Campanas, while Devin shared snippets about his own life experiences. As they continued talking, Devin sensed that Michael's life had not been devoid of challenges. Michael briefly mentioned the complexities that had arisen in his marriage, alluding to a third party entering the picture. Devin listened intently, taking sips of his beverage and engaging in the conversation. Curious about Michael's drink, Devin inquired about it, noting the cold latte in Michael's hand. Michael confirmed it and offered Devin a taste. The atmosphere between them was cordial, with a hint of underlying emotion as they reminisced and shared details about their respective lives. Overall, the encounter between Devin and Michael was filled with a mix of nostalgia, curiosity, and genuine interest in each other's journeys. Though time and circumstances had changed them both, the bond of their past friendship remained palpable in the air. Sure thing, Devin grinned. I'll pay, but if I do, I want the full scoop. Michael and his old buddy Devin had always been good guys. He had been absent for a while and might leave again, maybe for good. What the heck? Mike asked. It's not all rainbows and sunshine, but some things haven't been too terrible. Devin signaled the waitress and gestured towards their coffees. Go ahead, Mike. I want to know. So Michael began. Devin, I married the campaign R's girl. I always liked her, and when my brother left to join the Navy, I took a chance. Right said Devin. Celine and your brother David, right? They were a thing back in the day. Yeah, they were first love and all, you know. She and my brother dated in high school. David is older than me and Celine. She was crazy about him. It hurt her when he left. So you stepped up? Not right away. I had always had feelings for her, but she was David's girl. I suppose you could say I had a crush on her, but to her I was the younger brother, Devin remarked. But you did marry her. Celine was lonely. She kept visiting the house. She'd come to see my parents to ask if they heard anything, but David never got in touch. He was off somewhere. Or at least, that's what we believed. And let's not forget Devin. I married her, but she also married me. What? David wasn't traveling. Hard to say. Still a mystery. We didn't hear from him, but Celine kept coming around. She was worried. I was a senior. She was a junior. She had her prom, and I had mine. You know, I never had much luck with girls. Not like David. Yeah, I remember your brother. Doesn't everyone? He once told me that dating girls was like looking for a job. Keep asking until someone says yes. Celine said yes to your brother? Not really. Celine said yes. She loved him. She said yes. She would have married him. I'm sure she would have left school for him if he asked. But Celine was a devout Catholic girl. You're Catholic. You know what that means? Yeah, Devin replied. No sex before marriage. Yeah. To say the least, she was crazy. She was head over heels for him, but I was pretty sure Celine held my brother to his word. He must have gotten tired of waiting. I know he cared for her. 
He even gave her his class ring, but he was also leaving her behind. He was 18 and found himself a married woman who was bored. Sometimes I think that's why he left. Did the husband find out? Maybe. I'm not sure. All I know is David left and left poor Celine with a shattered heart. Her parents were worried. They thought she might do something drastic. Look, I admitted I cared for her. I really liked her, but she was my brother's girl. Did you help her? I didn't plan on it, but I guess that's how it turned out. On and off, at least. Devin took a sip of coffee. I see. I didn't understand back then. I didn't understand her or me. I wish I had. But then, who knows? It's complicated. You know, me being a worrier and all, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking she needed someone, someone who could be there for her. What happened in the end? Really, what happened? Michael leaned back. Get me another coffee and one of those scones, and I'll tell you everything. Devin flagged down the waitress, got the items, and returned. Michael began as David left, joined the Navy. That's what he said. And after that, no one heard from him for years. Celine was crushed. She was so in love with my brother. Well, most girls were. But Celine was different. She was delicate, a top student. She shied away from the athletic crowd. Sure, she played some sports, but Celine spent more time in the library and in church than hanging out with other students in trendy outfits. Did you like her? Not Celine. She was always proper and well-behaved. After David went away, she began to visit my mom and dad more often. She'd stay and chat. Soon, she and I were talking, too. I was a nerd, just like her. We had a lot in common, or so I thought. It was odd, but sweet the way she acted around me. Every time she saw me, her face would brighten. She'd get really excited, laugh, and act all bubbly, kind of like a happy squirrel. I might have been wrong, but when I saw her by herself, she'd wear baggy clothes, like big sweatshirts and loose sweatpants. But when she knew she'd see me, she'd wear something nice. By nice, I don't mean fancy or anything. I mean something cute and lively. She'd put on a lovely miniskirt and a soft, charming blouse. The blouses were simple, but somehow gently captivating. They made her look, well, you know. Celine had this amazing, long, dark, thick, smooth, and shiny hair. When I saw her around, her hair would be tied up purely for convenience. But around me, she either let it down or styled it in a braid, highlighting her graceful neck and lovely face. I might just be flattering myself, but I think she dressed up for me. I enjoyed her company a lot. She was always fun and happy. That happiness was nearly constant. The only time I saw her look down was when someone brought up my brother. Then she'd turn silent. Her eyes would widen, and she looked as if she was heartbroken. I really liked her a lot. I wished she had met me first. It was clear she still had feelings for David, and it hurt me. I also adored her scent. I'm not the best at describing this. She wore some perfume, maybe Chanel, and her hair smelled so clean and fresh, and her breath... I was head over heels for her. She had this little spray bottle for her mouth that I always noticed. When we first started dating, her lips tasted so sweet and soft. I couldn't get enough of her. I was obsessed, thinking about her all the time, even dreaming about her at night. I wanted to make her happy, to make her forget about my brother and fall in love with me instead. It was winter when we started dating. I was a senior in high school and she was always around, even though she had plenty of other options. I finally mustered up the courage to ask her out, and she said yes. We went on dates all spring, but nothing too serious happened. Just some innocent touching and flirting. We went to prom together, and to everyone else, it looked like we were deeply in love. But deep down, I knew she was still keeping her distance. I graduated and got into a local college, studying business and technology. I was good at math, so I figured it would be a great path for me. But I soon realized that math required more than just numbers and formulas. It required hard work and dedication, something I was willing to give for her. I was determined and dedicated, but love was making things difficult. It seemed like Celine only wanted to see me because of our connection, not to share news about my brother. I worked hard to save money for college, but by the summer after my freshman year, I had to work even harder to afford the next semester. During that summer, I had no time for dating or hanging out with friends. I took on tutoring jobs to make ends meet, mostly helping girls with their studies. It was just business for me, but Celine may have seen it differently. She told me she wanted to date other guys who were always in the pursuit of a new romance. He, on the other hand, was loyal and committed to her. I thought she was the one I wanted to spend my life with. 
but when she ended things with me and started dating around, my heart was broken. I found myself moping around at home when I wasn't working, and whenever I did go out, I would see her everywhere. It felt like she knew just where to find me, and it tore me apart. Despite my determination and hard work, love had a way of complicating things. I was left feeling lost and heartbroken, longing for the girl I thought was the one. It was a gut-wrenching experience that left me feeling empty and alone. She'd often be seen with the star of last year's football team or the current hit in college circles. There'd be a lot of close talks, hugs, and more. I just couldn't take it. More than once, I'd just up and leave. My pals told me, though, whenever I left like that, she'd cool off from whoever she was with and head home early, too. That's sort of what kept me hanging on. I believed she had love for me. But sometimes, she just acted poorly. To cut a long story short, I ended up letting go. I figured if she didn't get why I was working so hard, then she could just forget it. I was working for me. But part of me also felt the better I did, like getting into college, the better for her too. I was serious about her, truly. But then I started looking around. If she was seeing others, why not me? Turns out lots of girls were interested. It didn't take long to find a new girlfriend. Her name was Marge Vogel. She was pretty. She was smart. And she seemed a bit serious about me. Oddly, she said she'd had a crush on me since high school, even though we went to different schools. She explained that a friend of hers knew me, and she'd been keeping an eye on me since I was around 20 and inexperienced. Marge, different from me, had more life lessons to share. Once, in my car, things got heated. Suddenly, she reached over, managing my zipper, and showed me experiences I'd never had. "'Can't we stay here?' I asked. "'Where else can we go?' She mentioned her sister's place, married and with their own home they had space, and that's where we went. Her sister's house was nice, three bedrooms and even a finished basement. Down in the basement, Marge found a pull-out bed, and that's where we spent our time. The rest of the summer, Marge and I were pretty inseparable. She never bugged me about my job. Whenever I was free, we'd meet up, often ending up staying right there at her sister's house. I had a good time with Marge. She was fun, but deep down... I knew she wasn't the one for me, not for keeps. When Summer waved goodbye, Marge packed her bags for Ohio State. My heart felt a bit heavy. I told her I'd miss her presence. She said she'd miss me too, and just like that, she left. Marge taught me a lot about love and sex. She was my guide. But classes were calling and life had to move on. I thought about Marge now and then, but it was Celine who truly haunted my thoughts. Celine had finished school but didn't go to college. She landed a job at Lowe's in the tools aisle. I knew because she still came around my folks' place sometimes. We never chatted, though. And from what my mom said, she didn't ask about my brother David either. But she did sneak in questions about me, wondering if I was seeing somebody. Mom also mentioned that Celine was seeing a guy from Sears Electronics section, calling him a great catch. That's when strange things began. I was in my second year of college, Grades were strong, and I had a job on the side, but then my mom wanted the house painted. Dad couldn't do it because his back was bad, so I got the task. Mom suggested I paint instead of working elsewhere. She began giving me money for it. I quit my job. The goal was to paint the house. That meant getting paint and gear. We had a local store, but Mom wasn't a fan of the owner. She claimed he made her uncomfortable once. She also wasn't keen on Home Depot because she didn't like their colors. So we ended up at Lowe's. Lowe's, Home Depot, they all felt the same. And right across from the paints was the tools aisle, where Celine worked. Mom and her had a plan. Since Mom could only go to Lowe's to pick colors when Celine was there, I'd drive Mom. She'd start talking about colors with the pink guy. But first, she'd tell me to take a break and walk around. I never got far before Celine was by my side. She must have taken her break when she saw me, as she was always there. We'd chat a bit. She'd point out deals and talk about her dates. Then, on our third visit, next to the power saws, Celine told me she was done dating around and was ready to settle. She said this while playing with a circular saw blade. You know, Michael, I'm done running. I'm ready to settle down. I walked to where the files were. Following me by the electric sander, she asked, Did you hear me? I'm ready for you now. I picked up a sander and replied, I was ready before, but you left. How do I know you're serious now? She turned me to face her. I was thin, so that was easy. She held my elbows and said, 
I'm ready, Michael. I really am. I wasn't sure. I thought of David. What about my brother? I asked. What about him? She said. Come on. I know you dated me to be close in case he returned. I don't think you loved me then, and I don't think you do now. She held me tighter. Leaning in, she whispered, Okay, I dated you because you're David's brother, but now it's you I love. I told her I didn't believe her. She admitted, Honestly, I did think of David when with you, and sometimes I still do. But Michael, as I said, I love you now. I was still unsure. For me to believe, I need a real sign, something that shows me you truly love me. She answered, Let's go out and I'll show you what I mean. I said, How about next Friday night? She gave me a quick kiss. Friday, she said. And just like that, she was off. I went back to where mom was. She had finally picked all the paint she wanted. I asked her, Did you pick your colors? She smiled at me and said, Yes, dear, I did. They're all here. I looked down and saw she had four or five cans of white paint. I said, Mom, they're all white. She asked me, Did you and Celine make up? I just said, Darn. We got the paint and headed home. I started painting the house but never really finished it. Celine and I got back together, but she didn't want to settle down like I did. I had been with Marge and knew what I wanted. After our third date, I had to ask Celine. I said I wanted more than just a tease. I wanted something real. She smiled and said, What about just a touch? First, I thought, no way, I wanted all of it. But then I wondered, why did she say that? I told her, no, I want more, much more. She got all confused and said, maybe I could give you a kiss. Then I knew something was wrong. I said, Celine, if you love me, you would give me what I need. She whispered, no, I can't. I asked her, why not? She said, not before we're married. I got angry and told her, no, I can't wait. She broke down. If I did, then you would know. Crap. I thought, Know what? I watched her start to cry. I wasn't sure if it was real. I had learned to tell fake tears. She was crying or pretending to when she said, I can't give it to you. I don't have it anymore. Then she really started to cry. I asked, what's gone? I knew what she meant, but I couldn't believe it. She fell apart. It was Tommy Sheldon. What do you mean? I didn't give in, but she sobbed. He took it. You know, last summer was when Tommy Sheldon and I got together. She spoke so fast then. Faster than she ever did before. I was real mad at you then. You began seeing Marge Vogel. I knew what was going on between you two. I swore I'd make things right, but the only way to do it was, well, you know. No, I didn't know. I told her that's crazy. You went with Tommy Sheldon because he was part of the swim club. He was with you because he had a new car. But I know what really happened. David was with you before he left. She stopped crying. No, it was Tommy mainly because I wanted to swim every day. But David? No, he never was. Michael, you hate me now, right? I'm so sorry. I'll make it up to you. I'll be yours from now on. I'll do whatever you say. We were close to her place when this all came out, so I said, You'll do anything? She dried her eyes and said anything. I'll do what you want. She moved to kiss me. I love you, Michael. Only you. I said, Anything? Anything, Michael. You can even be with me any way you want. I thought, Why not? I said, if you'll do anything. She was nodding, yes. Then leave my car and never talk to me again, she paused. Michael, you don't mean that. You can't, I shouted as loud as I could. Get out of my car now. She backed off. I drove off fast, leaving her behind. I got an older buddy. He got me a bottle of whiskey and I began to drink as much as I could. I then realized what I had done. It was the dumbest thing a guy could do. I left her for someone else. All those times we were close and I held back because she'd be scared or say something. But not Tommy Sheldon. No way. And I'd bet a bunch of other guys didn't hold back either. Once I was a complete idiot. Never again. I swore I wouldn't let myself be that person anymore. Screw everything, I thought. Screw Celine, Tommy, Sheldon. And yeah, maybe not my mom, but definitely everyone else. And for sure, screw David. Wherever he was, I wanted more. I didn't want to just work at school or paint my parents' house or be stuck in some dead-end job, and I would definitely never work for Celine again. No. I embarked on a new journey. I decided I would meet as many girls as I could. I remembered this famous basketball player who bragged about being with 20,000 women. Thinking about it, no wonder he was gone now. Well, basketball wasn't my game, not really, but... Perhaps I could meet just a fraction of that number from that day on. 
It became my goal to be with as many women as possible. Surprisingly, it didn't take long to see how simple it started to seem. Somehow I was quite popular. Maybe Marge had spread the word. Or maybe the girls found me likable. Or perhaps everyone was as eager and careless as Celine. I remembered what my brother advised. Treat dating as if you're job hunting. If one said no, I moved to the next. Before long, I had a list of go-tos. Women and some who were older who were always there. Some wanted gentleness and warmth. Others wanted it tough and quick, while a few wanted to be taken out and told they were unique. It didn't matter to me. I was with all of them. Worried about getting sick? Of course. Isn't everyone? That's why protection exists. I stayed careful. For me, it wasn't really about the act or the enjoyment. It was about settling scores. I wasn't sure whom I was getting back at, but I felt compelled to continue. This went on for days, weeks, even months. But even the most unrestrained, the most indulgent, grow weary eventually. All the sex, the action, the thrill of it all started to lose its charm after a while. Retelling such an intricate emotional journey in simpler terms for a more general audience requires careful consideration of language while maintaining the gravity of the initial raw sentiment and the complex web of feelings and decisions of the narrator. I had to face the truth, though it was hard to swallow. I might have kept going, risking it all until something bad happened or someone caught me in the act, but then Celine changed everything. Well, not Celine directly, but a phone call from my mom late on a Friday night did. After my classes, I'd been to the bowling alley, met a girl, and things happened in the back of my beat-up Chevy. I dropped her off, kissed her goodbye, and went to my parents' place to get ready for work the following morning. I was in the bathroom when I heard the phone ring. My cell phone was somewhere downstairs, forgotten. Night calls were usually for me. Midwipe, I heard my mom's voice calling from below. She said I had to head to Bear Creek Road, ASAP. I shouted to ask why. She shouted that Celine was there, needing a lift home. I yelled back, suggesting Celine find someone else. But then Mom said she was crying, nearly out of her mind. She told me some guy had taken her there and tried to hurt her. Celine had fought him off, but was in a bad way, and her folks were out. Celine, an only child and pretty indulged, must be in a real pinch to call my parents for help. Realizing she was desperate, I told Mom I'd go as soon as possible. Mom urged me to hurry, saying Celine sounded really bad. I can't say I rushed for joy, but I did move fast. Bear Creek Road was silent and isolated, with creeks and a known broken bridge from past floods. I had no clue where to head. It took me about half an hour just to reach the road, and then another twenty minutes driving around before I found her brother. I wish I could tell you I was eager to help, but the truth is my heart was heavy, my mind racing. Yet as I navigated through the dark, the reality hit me. This was more than a random act of kindness. It was a wake-up call, a moment forcing me to see beyond my reckless chasing of fleeting highs. As I drove, the weight of what could have happened to Celine and the relief that she had escaped settled deep within me. It was a stark reminder of the deeper connections and responsibilities we hold to each other, often forgotten in the pursuit of selfish desires. In that drive, I found a clarity and a resolve to change, stirred by fear, concern, and and a newfound respect for the fragility of our human connections. Bear Creek Road is this old path that winds through the backwoods in the southwest part of our state. It's a place not many people live, full of trees, and really not a spot for a city girl like Celine to end up lost. Yet there I found her. She seemed okay, physically. It looked more like her pride took the hit. I asked her, why on earth are you out here? She seemed mixed up. Kind of out of it, but she gave me bits and pieces. I'm not sure, she said. I'm so glad you're here. I felt you would come. I'm drawing a blank. I think Tommy was with me, wanted to show me where he fishes. I couldn't wrap my head around her story. Celine, that's nonsense. You've never liked fishing. Heck, I can't count the times I asked you to join me. You always made some excuse. She looked so lost. I don't remember. There was a dance. Tommy's part of this club wanted me there. At first, it seemed like a lot of kids were there. But then she noticed all the girls had left. Just five or six boys remained. We weren't at the dance anymore. I can't recall moving. They wanted me to dance for them. I got scared, started to shout, I think. My memory's foggy. 
Celine's not known for fibbing. She sounded so confused, her story a jumble. I pressed on. Did you drink anything? Eat anything? She was sitting in the mud at the road's edge, not seeming to mind. Maybe some wine. Maybe something else. It was sweet. And they gave me food, something with garlic. That's when I noticed the clear signs of semen on her blouse. That got me raging. She wasn't making much sense, but it seemed like Tommy or one of his mates had drugged her. The Celine I knew months ago wouldn't touch stuff like that. But this girl was a stranger. It seemed like she was high on something real fierce. Maybe even that high-grade stuff that makes Molly seem chill. If it was Molly and not too much of it, we'd be thanking our stars she was still breathing. Eileen went over to help her stand. Apart from a few cuts, ripped clothes, and mud stains, she looked okay. Her bra was half off and her pants were torn. She must have fought hard. Hard enough to scare someone tough like Tommy Sheldon. I found her purse and used my phone to call hers, spotting it by a puddle near the road. I'm no muscle guy, more on the lean side, but I could carry her. I picked her up, took her to my car, and laid her in the back, covering her with a comforter I had just used. I cleaned her face with my handkerchief, spitting on it for moisture. She fell asleep real fast. I drove her to my parents' house. Mom was awake and panicked at the sight of her. Dad managed to calm her down while I brought Celine in and put her on the couch. She was still out cold. Now, I was truly worried. I told my mom something was wrong, that she'd been with some guys who must have drugged her. We should maybe take her to the ER. Dad thought so, too, and we all got into the car, my folks up front, me and Celine in the back. The hospital wasn't far, and we got there quick. All the while, I was thinking about those stories of girls who'd been drugged, either ending up dead or in a coma for years. I was honestly terrified. At the hospital, we rushed in, explaining the situation to them. Doctors were quick to take her in while we filled out forms and waited. The waiting room felt cold and time seemed to slow down. My mind raced with all sorts of thoughts, worrying about Celine, regretting not being there to protect her. Thankfully, after what felt like hours, a doctor came out. He said she was stable, likely drugged, but they were doing all they could. He reassured us she was strong, fighting through it. We could finally breathe a bit easier, knowing she was getting the help needed. Sitting there, waiting for more news, I promised myself to be there for her, to help her through whatever came next. This night had changed us, brought a scary reality too close. But together, with family and friends, we'd get through it, one step at a time. At that moment, it hit me hard. It didn't matter who she had been with. All that filled my mind was my love for her and the fact she was in real danger. I also faced the truth that she hadn't always been the easiest person to deal with. Despite being a good girl on paper, she always got her way. Looking back, I guess I played a part in that too. We rushed her to the hospital quick. I spilled everything I knew to the nurse at the desk and they took her straight through. When I tried to ask what the plan was, I got no answers, just a direction to sit down. Her parents got to go with her, but not me. That's when I caught on to how the hospital staff saw me. Covered in mud, just like Celine and being the same age, it must have looked bad. They probably thought I was to blame for her condition. Heck, they even called the cops. I sank into a chair and pulled out my phone, determined. I had to find Tommy Sheldon, that guy who I was sure was behind this. And if Celine didn't make it, he was a dead man. I called around and finally I got Sheldon's number. When he picked up sitting at home relaxed, I laid into him. I warned him to come to the hospital or else. He tried to act tough, saying he wasn't scared of me. I shot back, telling him about the evidence on her shirt that would lead straight to him. He hung up quickly. All the while, the medical team was busy with Celine, throwing suspicious glances my way like I was some criminal. Then the cops showed up, pointed out by one of the nurses. They were a duo, one man, one woman, coming straight for me. I quickly explained, I'm her ex-boyfriend. She called my folks, and I found her like this. I didn't hurt her, but I can't say who did. Right then, a doctor from another country came out and whispered to one of the nurses. She walked over to us. Are you Michael Sullivan? I said yes with a nod. Celine's awake, she told me. She's been out of it crying and calling out for you. She keeps saying you saved her life. She's not fully alert, but we think she will be okay. I glanced at the cops. We good? 
Can I see her? The female officer spoke up. First, give us your full name. I responded, Michael Sullivan. She then asked for the name of the person who might have hurt her. Tommy Sheldon, I blurted out, feeling like a fool right after. I could tell she thought I wasn't making sense. I gathered my thoughts and explained. I'm Michael Sullivan. The guy who's been troubling her is Tommy Sheldon. He's been mistreating her for a while. There might be some of his stuff on her shirt. The female officer glanced at her partner. Find this Sheldon guy. Then, looking at the nurse, Can we take her shirt for evidence? I asked once more if I could see Celine. The policewoman nodded. That's all I needed. As I moved to her room, I saw her, barely awake. I stood by her, and when she saw me, even with her eyes half shut, she reached for my hand. Holding it, she whispered so faintly, I love you. It felt like I stood there holding her hand for an eternity, though it was just a couple of minutes. Then this doctor, whose words were hard to catch, began explaining to me. He said Celine got lucky. They weren't sure how much of the substance she had been given, but mixing it with alcohol and given her small build, it could have been deadly. He mentioned she might be okay in a few days or not. He warned about the dangers of modern substances kids are into these days, saying they're as dangerous as heroin, if not more. He said she might leave the hospital tomorrow, completely fine, or she could have lasting brain damage. This story isn't just about a close call. It's about the scary reality of modern dangers, mixed with hope, fear, and the strength of human connection. Sometimes the line between tragedy and a second chance is paper thin. He told me if she had brain harm, it might not mess with her moving around, but could mix up her thinking straight. That doctor talk freaked me out. Celine was always good at heart, kind. Okay, she wasn't sharp, more goofy and not grown up. She was someone I joked about being mad at a lot. She did hurt me before and she got on my nerves no end, but I never wished her harm. I knew we needed a deep chat. They found Tommy Sheldon. He said no to all, but the mess on her top was found to be his, and he owned up to that much. I was mad at Sheldon and swore to myself I'd deal with him, but glad Celine was okay. She got home by Monday. I was over at her place Monday night after school. We had stuff to clear up. Her mom and dad were there when I arrived. They were happy to see me. Celine's dad shook my hand. Man, I'm thankful for you, Michael. She could have been gone if not for you. Her mom felt the same. We three sat in the living room while Celine was waiting downstairs in their den. I shared that Celine, someone I felt for. You both know it. But truth is, we clash. I think she digs me as much, but we just clash. I was wrong. Celine wasn't downstairs. She was in the kitchen. She called out, That's not right. We love each other. It's just that we're two alike. I stood up, Mr. and Mrs. Camp Norris. Can you excuse me? I'd like to talk to your daughter if that's okay. Both nodded. Mr. Camp Norris said, Go for it. I walked back to the kitchen and saw Celine at the table. She had a glass of wine. I looked at her hard. What are you doing? She shot back. Having a glass of wine. Why? Geez, Celine, if you weren't so tipsy that night, Sheldon wouldn't have gotten away with his tricks. But he did. My God, Celine, he could have hurt you bad. She took another sip and said with a smirk, I'm not with Tommy Sheldon now, am I? I'm here with you. And you, you'd never hurt me. Jesus, Celine, I yelled, you're being so foolish. I've been fooling around using girls left and right. Since you played the Tommy card. She stood, tipped her wine down the drain and said, First, keep it down or my folks will hear. And second, I lied about Tommy Sheldon. I made it up to get you riled up. I didn't want to doubt her. I wanted to believe, but just couldn't. You really sold it when you said he did. Now I'm finding it hard to swallow. She moved closer, took my hand in hers. She asked, You want me to prove I'm still pure? I laughed. That's not happening, and we both know it. You're nearly 20, not sheltered from the world. I've seen you in sports, riding, playing hockey, soccer, and volleyball. You've been too active. If you say you're untouched, I must be a freak of nature. She caressed my arm, not looking at me. That was a clear sign she was about to fib. Very softly, she said, Maybe not untouched, but trust me, no one has. She paused, then added, Not there, or anywhere else. I didn't believe her. How about the other stuff? Been with a lot of guys? She drew back her hands. Not as many, just Tommy. And I would have with David. I caught that distant look again. David, I echoed. 
It's always him at the end, right? I saw her wince. But then something in her eyes changed. He was my first, but she quickened. You're my last. I mean it. No more Tommies or Davids or... I caught the look and the pause. She was about to say one more name, but stopped herself. I threw out the name Jerry, right? She seemed shocked, but got over it fast. Yeah, Jerry too, but he only touched me a bit. I shrugged. That makes me feel so much better. I had to make her see, or all of this, any future thing would mean nothing. Look, Celine, you know what you mean to me. I've been with other girls. She cut me off. Yeah, like Marge Vogel. Then I cut her off. Yes, her and more, but you. I've always loved you. And Marge? That was after you left to be with others, you remember? She seemed ready to argue. And what about those guys? I raised my hand to stop her. Listen, Celine, I'm doing great in school. I'm really good with tech stuff, and I'm learning a lot about running a business. After school, I'll do well, but I need to stay focused. If you're in, you need to be by my side, not behind me, not hiding. You have to be there for just me. I have to trust you. Right now, I don't. She leaned back. Okay, I get it. So, Michael, I have an idea. I was a bit doubtful. Really? She went to sink, got a glass, filled it with water, and drank. Let's start fresh. I'm only 19. I just finished high school. I've been foolish, childish. I know I'm spoiled. I've done wrong, but I'm the girl you fell for. You're the boy I loved. Then I stood up. Start fresh like beginning again? Yes, she said. Go home, wait some days, then call me. Ask me out. It'll be a new start. Michael, I promise it'll be worth it. I couldn't help but smirk. So here we were at this point, where the past could be put back, and a new door could open, where mistakes could shrink in the rear view, and the road ahead could be ours to shape. Hope, it seems, had found a way to sneak back in, pressing us towards a future where us could be a thing again. A fresh start with all its risks and promises beckoned. I nudged my finger back and forth, snug between my left thumb and index finger. She just watched, rooted in place. After a beat, she spun words that tagged the moment as the start of something. This won't be easy, but I'll give you everything, Michael Sullivan, everything you dream of. Her eyes told me she wasn't playing games. But don't push your luck. Still, you'll get all you wish for and maybe more. I had to wonder just what that meant. I moved in, aiming for a kiss. But she stepped back, hands up like a barrier. Nope, you haven't even asked me out yet. I halted. All right, I'm off. Let's call tomorrow a new beginning, I suggested. She agreed. A new start. Exiting the kitchen through the dining and living rooms, I reached the front door, glancing back, gave them a wave. See you soon. Mrs. Campa and Norris echoed back, See you soon, Michael. With that, I left, feeling the weight of what might lie ahead. I waited a full week before ringing her for that first date. Those seven days were crammed with thoughts. See, we'd circled each other for nearly four years, from just knowing names to closely crossing paths during my last year of high school, her being a year behind me. Now, midway through my college sophomore year, our history was a mix of clashes and reconciliations, good days and not so good ones. I was set on packing up old grievances, ready to bury them if this was going to work. No more dwelling on past hurts, I decided. Then there were the ghosts. Sure, Celine had thrown Marge's name into the mix, but we both had our share of shadows. She could have listed other girls, and I too had to face the memory of guys like Tommy, Sheldon, Jerry fellows who'd hovered around her some recently. But they were distractions, nothing more. Real troubles were less about her recent admirers and more about personal battles, like grappling with the shadow of my brother. This rewind meant facing our own tales head-on, ready or not. My brother's past shadow clung to me, dark and cold. I love him, but part of me wished he'd stay away. Then there was her. Did I love her enough to start fresh? That was easy to answer. Yes, I loved her deeply. But as a man, I knew I had to work hard for us to be good again. Yet she had to do her part, too. No more games. We were about to be one. No space for others. I called her. I kept things light. Hi, is this Celine Campanis? She said, yes, is this Michael Sullivan? I replied, yes, I've got 60 bucks burning a hole in my pocket. Fancy helping me spend it? Celine said, I'm good at spending money, Michael. What's the plan? I suggested. How about dinner and some ice skating? She loved skating. I'd love that. When? This Friday at six o'clock, I said. She was excited. Sounds great. See you then. 
I hung up, pleased. That was the start of round two with Celine Campana. We did things she liked. Ice skating, movies, snacks at the college union, drives in the country. Once we spotted an owl and kept checking on it. We kept things light and happy. When spring semester started, things got more serious. I was gentle, never pushing. She was okay with getting closer. As we got more intimate, we talked more about the future, our hopes and dreams. In this new chapter with Celine, every step was careful, but full of hope. We were navigating this path together, mindful of past hurts, but eager for a new beginning. Each moment spent together, each laugh, each shared dream was a brick in the foundation we were building. The world outside buzzed with its own rhythm, but for us, in our bubble, time seemed to slow, allowing us to savor the present, cherish our discussions about the future, and slowly, tenderly, weave a new tapestry of us. We chatted about kids, family, and God a lot. Celine was super into her faith. She once shared that she thought about being a nun and helping out in far-off places. That kind of threw me off. Because Celine is usually an open book. I can always tell when she's not being straight with me. When she spoke about being a nun, she was 100% genuine. I started to see she was way more complex than I first thought. The stuff she said about Tommy and then took back, I believed her. Celine was more than just a pretty face. Nope, she wasn't just some flirty girl. There was real depth there. But the situation with David still bugged me. Celine had changed in other ways, too. Over the past year, she got curvier. Her body looked fuller, and she had grown a bit taller. I figured she was around five feet, five or six inches now. I adored her hair getting longer and how she styled it. Her skin had this warm, smooth look. No spots or flaws, just that perfect glow you see in girls from southern Italy. Physically, she was flawless, but her personality was always the best part about her. The kind, lively Celine I fell for in high school was still there, but now she had this grown-up grace. If I said something dumb or harsh, she had this knack for turning it around with her gentle touch. She showed two things she hadn't before. Yes, she still had a quick temper, but it never lingered. She'd get mad over something and then quickly start laughing about how silly it was. Being with her was always a blast. Now, more than ever, I found her not just fun, but truly special. She was kind and soft at heart. My Celine was growing up, turning into a real woman. I hoped I could keep up with her. By that time, I saw she was the grown-up between us. She still worked at Lowe's, but now she saved her money instead of spending it all. She saved some for me, too. I was busy with school, always studying. She gave me space and supported my studies. She was more than a girlfriend to me. She helped buy new tech stuff and learned about new tech as much as I did. She was more than a girlfriend. She was my partner. Together, we made a great team. As my sophomore year was ending, I felt we were ready for the next step. We hadn't gone all the way yet. Sure, we had our moments and made good use of being more than friends, but not too much. We figured out how to be happy with each other without the worry of a baby. One time, something happened that stressed me out more than it should. We had been out, and I left my wallet at her mom's place by mistake. It was late, and her parents were asleep. Celine picked up my wallet and jokingly asked, What's this? I laughed, reached out saying, Okay, give it back. But she didn't. Suddenly, she was looking through my wallet, checking out all my cards. Nothing odd. A visa, driver's license, library card, the usual. Then she found the part where I keep my pictures. There were pics of mom and dad, a pic with my buddy David. But what got her was a bunch of her pics, around six of them, from times and places she didn't know I was there. She gave back my wallet and started talking about something else, but I didn't let it go. I grabbed her purse, found her wallet, and started my search. I skipped the cards and went straight to the pictures. I found the usual stuff, pics of her mom and dad, some with cousins and her grandparents. But when it was my turn, I saw nothing. I recalled I had given her my grad photo. Yet it wasn't there. Instead, there was one. Someone else's photo. Yeah, David's. And it looked worn, as if it had been touched a lot. On the back, words were there, but I couldn't read them. She took it from me fast. Then, it hit me. She knew my space well. She'd seen my room with all its odd stuff. The car mags, the tiny planes, the music discs. But I'd never seen her room. Not even once. Without thinking, I stood and rushed to the stairs. Taking two steps at a time, Celine right on my heels. I pushed into her room. It felt like a punch to my gut. 
It was filled with girly things, dolls, lace, all that. There was an old photo near her bed. It showed her and David from years back. Looking around, not a single photo of me. None at all. I turned and there she was. That look on her face told me everything. Nothing had changed. It was always David. I moved past her, left the house, got into my car and drove home. I hadn't been home for five minutes before I heard a car. In the depths of my sadness, I peeked outside. Celine had followed me. She hurried up to my front door, tears in her eyes. No, she said. You've got it wrong. It's not him. She had photos in her hands, dropping them at my feet. All of David. Okay, it was a mess. I hadn't even thought. She didn't let me speak. She rushed into me, making my arms hug her close. I wanted to step back. I really did. In this moment of confusion and revelation, emotions swirled between us. Despite my efforts to keep distance, the intensity of the moment, the raw feelings, and the mess of photos scattered at our feet painted a scene of complex emotions. The room charged with a mixture of sadness, misunderstanding, and a glimmer of hope. We stood there, entwined in an embrace that spoke volumes more than words could. She held me close, refusing to let go, and brought my face down to hers, locking us in a kiss. She pushed forward, walking me backward into my parents' living room. We crashed on the couch together, falling back. I sneaked a look at the clock. It was late. Before I knew it, Celine had my shirt off and was working on my pants. I reached for her blouse. Two minutes later, we lay there without clothes on my parents' couch. She started on top, but soon I was... We were eye to eye. I'd never seen her look at me like that before. Her eyes were all pupil. Three seconds more and we were one. It ended almost as soon as it began. I couldn't control it. I didn't know if she did. I never asked. Not then, not after. I lay there for a bit on top of her while she held me tight. She hugged me so hard I struggled to breathe. It felt like she was scared to let go. After a while, she eased up. I sat up and she moved to lie next to me. I was shaken and she looked all messed up, but she seemed in charge. When she spoke, it was soft but firm. You're mine, got it? I nodded. She got dressed and left. We never talked about what happened. Nothing like it occurred for months. She kept me at a distance like always, as if it never happened. After she left, I tried to clean the couch. A normal person would think I wasn't normal. Her act didn't make me feel safe. I felt more unsure. But life went on. In June, when sophomore year ended, I managed to get everyone together. My folks, Charlene's folks, and hers all met one afternoon at the diner. It was on me. I think everyone but Celine knew the real purpose of the meetup. I was finishing up dessert and having coffee. I reached into my pocket and pulled out a tiny box with the ring. I was seated between her mom and mine. Celine was across from me. I didn't stand and do the big knee thing. Not then, anyway. I just quietly, I think coolly, put the little box on the table and pushed it toward Celine with my finger. At first, she didn't see what it was. Then she did. She didn't leap up or cry out. No tears came. She saw the box for what it was and smiled at me. A sweet, kind smile. She reached over, ignoring the box, and touched my hand. She whispered a yes that was so quiet. That's when I stood, walked around and knelt by her, opened the box in her hand, took out the ring, and put it on her finger. My mom clapped. Celine's mom had out a handkerchief and was crying. Celine, looking at the small diamond, turned, smiled, and kissed my cheek. She said, I love you. I kissed her too, on the lips. I said, then you'll make me happy and marry me. She smiled again and said, you know I will. Then her dad got the waiter, grabbed a bottle of red wine, and we all toasted. By then, her mom and mine were buzzing about the wedding. Her mom said they'd need to adjust her wedding dress since Celine was a bit fuller figured. I hadn't thought about that, but it seemed decided. Celine would wear her mom's wedding dress. It was her grandma's long ago. Celine's grandparents on her mom's side were gone. Her granddad had fought in Vietnam. He married Celine's grandma before he left. Celine's mom wore it at her wedding. Now it was Celine's turn. My mom once told me about some old family jewelry, stating it would go to Celine. I couldn't help but think about David, my older brother who was no longer with us. Maybe it was selfish, but I longed for that jewelry too. After a family meal, Celine and I left in my car. We drove around, chatting about future plans like college, buying a house, and starting a big family. This wasn't new to us. 
Celine was an only child and dreamt of a large family. I was okay with whatever made her happy. Holding hands in the car, I cursed the new cars for their uncomfortable seats. That summer was incredibly good. I landed a job that paid well above the minimum wage. Celine, meanwhile, had climbed up to a supervisor role where she worked. It was a good time for women at her company, and she was making decent money. As junior year approached, we were optimistic about our future. Then life threw us a curveball. Celine got pregnant. She had issues with birth control, so we were using what we thought was a reliable method. Then came Mary at the end of July. We managed a short honeymoon to Niagara Falls before returning to start our life together. Both our families pitched in, furnishing our place with a mix of new and old items. We lived in a cozy apartment above Mr. and Mrs. Camp's garage. It felt like playing house, but it was real and wonderful. Celine returned to work while I secured another summer job, allowing us to save up for college. Fall arrived and we were a well-oiled machine. I had also found a decent evening job thanks to Mr. Camp and Chris, which was close to home and not time-consuming. This setup gave me loads of free time, enabling me to get my studies done before heading home. Throughout this journey, the blend of joy and struggle, of aspirations and reality, crafted a rich tapestry of our young lives. We were learning, growing, facing life's trials together with resilience and love, always looking forward to the future with hope and determination. Celine was always there, hard at work online both day and night, lending a hand with my heavy load of school projects. Over at her job at Lowe, her bosses really liked her, and soon she was on track for a promotion and more work to do. Her bosses were kind folks. One was a man who had seen many years, the other a woman still on the young side. So I had no fear about any bad stuff happening at work, the kind that some husbands might worry about. Indeed, life was looking bright for us Sullivans. Things were going so well that one evening we all decided to meet up for a cozy family dinner at the neighborhood diner. Celine and I were buzzing with excitement. We sneaked in some time together before her mom and dad were supposed to pick us up. Just as we were wrapping up, we heard them down by the garage. Celine hurried with her diaphragm, and then we dashed off. Oh, what a night it was. What a splendid April night. I went for Haddock and Celine chose Lobster. Life was sweet. Not long after that, I wrapped up my spring semester with top marks. Celine got her raise, and thanks to Mr. Camp and Norris, I landed a great summer job. Just one more year and I'd be graduating. Local companies were already showing interest in me. When Celine missed her period, we didn't think much of it at first. But by June, when she started feeling unwell, we sensed something was up. We sat down and talked it through. It must have been the night we went out with our folks. Celine had been cautious, but as it turns out, cautious meant using both a diaphragm and spermicide, not just the former. We were about to add to our family. Heck, we were already on our way. The thought of not having the baby never really stuck. Sure, we could have chosen otherwise. But then we'd spend the next 50 years wondering, what if? We knew we couldn't live with those kinds of questions. Both our parents were somewhat happy and supported our choice to keep the baby. Support and love from both our families made us feel ready for what was coming. Knowing we had each other, and the belief in handling whatever life threw at us, filled us with warmth and a sense of readiness. And with each passing day, our excitement and love for the life growing inside Celine only deepened. The journey wasn't going to be easy, but together we felt unstoppable. Every little kick, every moment of discomfort, brought us closer and made the bond with our upcoming little one even stronger. Life was taking us on a new adventure, and we were ready to embrace it with open arms and hopeful hearts. Celine and I had to do some quick math. With a bit of luck, we could just about scrape by until my senior fall term. But, as luck would have it, finishing my undergrad would need a bit more time. Celine worked it out. I'd be wrapping up about half a year late, but with both our moms ready to step in to help, we pushed through summer. Celine got us set for Lamaze. She made our small place baby ready. We hunted down deals at yard sales and thrift stores. Our grandparents dug through their attics, and before long we had everything for the baby. Even the diapers. Did we save every penny? You bet. But it was all for the best reason. We were living with real purpose. Man, it felt good. Fall swung around and I was back in class. We packed my schedule full. Getting done sooner was the goal. Those days were golden. I might be a bit full of it, but going to Lamaze made me so proud. 
Celine, pregnant, was a sight. I was bursting with happiness. The first ultrasound, the first kick. Learning our baby was a girl. We flipped through countless books for the perfect name. Celine even dreamed of saving for her college. What a time. Celine, glowing and pregnant, never seemed more radiant. My love for her grew. With our baby on the way, I was over the moon. She was an amazing wife and daughter and would be the best mom. Not that it was all smooth. There was morning sickness, tears, midnight runs for strange food cravings, worries about the birth, fears of health issues, and Celine fretting over her figure post-birth. We had the same worries all expecting parents do, but we faced them as one, never skipping mass. I never was a Catholic before, but switching churches was no big deal to me. Celine wanted it all perfect. If it meant going Catholic, I was like, sure, let's do it. Celine Sullivan, that's her. No way. Little Camp Norris was my everything. I adored her. When the blessed day came, our baby girl was born at 11.03 a.m., January 11th. She was our darling Sarah Angelina, now a part of the Sullivan clan. She weighed in at 6 pounds, 7 ounces, and was 19 inches exactly. A perfect new little person, so new and so pure. Seeing Celine hold our precious bundle made me the happiest guy ever. My brother David had been gone for around four years, about the time for a Navy stint. I didn't think much of it. David had been away so long and no word from him, it felt like I'd almost forgotten I had a brother. Then at one o'clock in the afternoon, Mom calls, all thrilled. Guess what, Michael? What? I ask. We win the lottery or something? Nope. David's back. My head spun. Memories and worries came flooding back. What would I say? How would Celine react? What about David? He had no right to Celine. He chose to leave, not her. It was me who stayed. I was the one who was there for her, healing her sorrows. She was my lady, my wife. Then, old concerns popped up again. When we got together, Celine told me she had been with no one else, that there was no Tommy Sheldon. Deep down, I felt that might not be true. From the start, I suspected. I thought I could tell if she had been with someone else, though I hoped not. But really, who could know? And did it matter? But now, David was back. What was going to happen next? Celine had just finished her shower. It was almost time for her work. I called again. Hey, Celine! I shouted. Yes, love? That was my mom calling out. Guess who's back? She walked in, her dark hair wrapped in a towel, wearing a robe. Who? She asked, curious. I tried to keep it cool, but it didn't work. David's back. I saw the look in her eyes. Wow! She still had feelings for him. Now I'm not big on music, but I've always liked country. Alabama was my top choice until they stopped. Their song, Old Flame, hit me hard. The words stuck in my head. An old flame still burns in your eyes. Tears can't hide it or make up. That old flame still alive made my stomach turn. Really? When did he come back? Celine's voice was tight. A weight pulled at my heart. Just now, Mom said. Celine moved towards our room. Guess we should have him over. Check the baby. Smells a bit off, I think. I heard her dress up for work. She'd leave soon. I went to check on our kid, keeping busy. In ten minutes, Celine left for her two to ten shift. She was a supervisor, stayed later than others. I had hours to worry. Good it was Friday. She'd be back early tomorrow. I started work later at nine, right after Mom and Chris came to watch Sarah. We were into spring term. I had plans to study tonight. Only a few classes left for me. And now David was back. How to deal with this? But not long after, David came by our place. Things took a turn. He came with a case of some pricey beer. Of course. Because of the baby, we had a no-drink rule at our place. I let him in but said, Dave, Mom just rang, said you were back. He gave me that smile I didn't like much. He was like, yeah, just got here and thought I'd swing by. He was holding the beer up like a trophy. I glanced at it and forced a smile. Looks good, but Celine's not into having booze around, you know, with the baby and all. Dave just brushed past me, beer in hand. Come on, it's me, Michael. Celine will be fine with it. Onto our stairs he went, heading to our kitchen. I trailed behind him. Into the fridge he shoved six packs, then cracked open one for himself and passed another to me. He downed his in an instant, a move we called a torpedo back then. Gladly, Sarah was asleep. David leaned back. So, little bro, tell me everything. I hear you ended up marrying Celine. Even got a kid now. How'd you pull that off? He was on his second beer already, and I hadn't even touched mine. Something about him was off. 
It wasn't just the stint in the Navy. Others came back from service without this. This ragged look. I should be happy, right? He's my brother. But there, I was, feeling uneasy about him. To me, he felt like a stranger, or worse, an enemy now. Yet he was still my brother. Something about him just didn't sit right with me. It was in his appearance, something I'd seen around town in others but hoped never to see in David. He looked like an addict. That sharp, desperate look Shakespeare wrote about was there. David always had this bold attitude, but now there seemed to be a harshness to it. I tried to recall, was this always who he was? He was skinnier, and those tattoos, they were not the kind you'd get at a proper studio. Sailors got tattoos, sure, and nowadays they were pretty trendy. Yet his were crude, inked in black, not the work of someone who cared about the craft. They told a story of their own, one I wasn't sure I wanted to know. How had my brother, the one I grew up with, turned into this? A wave of sadness mixed with fear washed over me. Here was Dave, but not the Dave I remembered. How do we bridge this gap, or was it too late? My heart felt heavy, pondering what next, how to reconnect, or if it was even possible, but I knew his ink. They were the kind made behind bars. I wondered if he'd ever served time if he'd really been in the Navy. I had to ask him. It's been four years since we last spoke, so how was the Navy? He gave me a grin, but it looked more like a sneer. The Navy. It was something. But it was time to leave. You get me? I pushed a bit. Come on, Dave, four whole years. What'd you do? Were you on a ship? He cracked open another beer. Yeah, I was on a big one. Ever heard of the Ronald Reagan? Then he switched topics. Heard you and Celine tied the knot. Got a little one now, I hear. When's the big day? What? That was out of the blue. I decided to steer the conversation back to the Navy. He'd shown up in a car that screamed money, way beyond anything we could afford. I mentioned it. Looks like the Navy treated you well. That's some car you've got. He turned away, avoiding my gaze. Yeah, it did. So, Mom says you've got a daughter now. Want to meet her? He gave me what was more a smirk than a smile. Yeah, show me the kid. I got up and he followed. Leave the beer, I told him. He set it down. Sure, buddy. He followed me into the room we had turned into a nursery. Celine and I were always close by, especially with all the scary stuff about SIDS. We made sure everything was safe for our baby. I showed Dave our daughter. He bent over, looking out of place, uneasy. I could understand that. But then he gave a nasty grin. That I didn't get. She yours? That threw me off. I couldn't believe he'd ask that. I tried to smile, but it was hard. Yeah, she's mine. He looked past me towards the computer. Mind if I smoke? I was shocked. Let me tell you, seeing Dave after all that time was a trip. He showed up out of the blue, acting all mysterious, talking about his time in the Navy, but dodging the real stories. And that car of his, it was swanky, high-end, not what you'd expect from just Navy pay. Makes you wonder, right? Then, looking at our little girl like that, asking if she was really mine. What's that about? And wanting to smoke in her room, no less. Dave was always a rebel, but something about him now felt off, more than just different. Something wasn't right, and it was unsettling, to say the least. I said no. Not here. No way. Celine and I don't like smoke, and we keep it away from our baby. I made sure to stress our baby. He took a step back. No smoke, no drink, no bad stuff. What is this, a jail? I tried to smile, but didn't really feel it. No, it's our kid's room. Thank God Sarah didn't wake up. I grabbed my brother's arm and led him back to the kitchen. He just went along. His arm felt too thin. I'm not big. Actually, I'm quite thin. Celine jokes that a strong wind might carry me away. Well, maybe not that bad, but still. David's arm felt like just bones. He looked weak. Walking him to the kitchen, something else hit me. It seemed like he was checking everything we had, like he was planning something. In the kitchen, he asked how I made things work with Celine. I shared our story, but skipped the rough bits about Tommy Sheldon and our fights. When I was almost done, David said something shocking. He said, Yeah, I remember Celine was pretty hot. Good for you getting with her. I stayed quiet. So did he for a bit. Then he got it. Hey, Michael, nothing happened between us, you know. Nothing. Now it was my turn to smirk. This wasn't like my brother. Yeah, I know. She would have told me if something did. He glanced at the fridge. 
He was on his last beer from the six-pack he started. I barely touched my first beer. He looked from the fridge to me and back. Mind if I... I smiled. Yeah, you should take that with you. Celine would freak if she saw it here. He understood. I was sending him off. He tried another one of those not-really smiles. Mom says you're in college, I said. Yeah, almost done with year two. Actually, tonight's for studying. That message came through. He got it. Yeah, he had to go. He rose and walked to the fridge. Need me to leave some for you? No, I told him. Celine would have my head. He laughed for real at that. Yeah, she can be tough. I cut him off before he could go on. I know, I said sharply. He grabbed his beer, saluted jokingly, and headed for the door. I saw him out, then rushed back up to check on Sarah. She was sound asleep. I got close, just to be sure. All was well. I returned to my study area and flopped down on the bed. I had books to go through, but I wanted to stay near my little girl, too. It felt like my whole being was on high alert, ready to protect my home and family. I tried to focus on studying, but my mind kept drifting to my brother. I wondered about his life in the Navy, if he had actually been in the Navy. I saw him for who he was now, a man who brought trouble, who was wrapped in danger. Had he changed, or had I been too naive to see the real him before? As a kid, his wild acts seemed exciting. Now they scared me. I knew not to trust him. I was sure Celine would figure him out, too. I calmed myself. No need to worry. Sarah began to stir. Time for her feed. I stood up. Celine came in at her usual time and spotted the beer cans in the trash. My mistake. I thought it might be good for her to see them. That was a low move on my part. But she needed to know. Where'd these come from? David stopped by. He brought them. She looked puzzled. You let him drink here with the baby around? Honestly, he just brought them, I explained. I couldn't stop him in time. She frowned. I thought we said no alcohol with the baby here. He jumped at me, Celine. He went first. She was all worn out. Didn't want to pick a fight. We're done with that, okay? Sure, love, I said. You're beat. Need a back rub? She let out a yawn and a scowl. No, just the trash, please. I'm beat. I'm hitting the hay. I took the trash out, then went back in to check on Sarah. She needed a change. So I did that. By the time I stripped and was bed ready, Celine was out cold. We usually snuggle a bit before sleep, but not tonight, I guess. She wasn't asleep, though. She murmured something to me. Celine was curled up, facing away, her head resting on her pillow. Your mom said to call her today. She did? Yeah. So I rang her during my break. You've seen David. Your mom's worried sick. Yeah. I saw him, but didn't spot anything alarming. Celine flipped over. He's got brucellosis. Got it in the Mediterranean, your mom said. They sent him back home because of it. He's in a bad way. The image of David crossed my mind. He did look weak, but I doubted it was what mom mentioned. Mom said that? Yep, she's beside herself. Wants us to keep an eye on him. Damn. I suspected the guy was hiding something. He whispered. Then the house phone buzzed. A Saturday call, likely a sales pitch, but I answered. My mom. Hello, Michael. Hi, mom. What's going on? David's sick with Brucellosis Island. Hope mom missed my slip. Yeah, Celine filled me in. We've got our hands full then, she said back. I dug around online before Celine clocked in for work. Showed her it was made up. David was spinning tails. Celine wouldn't have it. Didn't expect mom to either, but I gave it a shot. Look, mom, this brucellosis business is make-believe. I'm not calling him a liar, just he's confused. He's got other issues. Michael, he's your kin. He's owed vet benefits. They should be helping him, but they won't. Didn't you see the news? Vets are being let down left and right. Now it's happening to your bro. Mom was spot on about the vets. But in that moment, I wasn't so sure. David, he's a vet. Took off four years back. Told us he's joining the Navy. Then, radio silence until the other day when he shows up looking to me anyway, like he's deep into drugs, saying he caught something while he was serving. Things weren't adding up. But that's not what I told Mom. I said, Mom, we're going to stand by him. Okay, Michael jumps in. He'll need our love and care till he's on his feet again. Don't you worry, Mom. We got this. Thanks, sweetie. Gotta go now. Your brother's with us in his old room. Didn't sleep well, I bet. I hear him moving around, so I'm off to make breakfast. Bye. Bye. With Mom off the phone, I hung up too. Damn, I thought. He did have a rough night. Left here with all that beer. My folks' place is dry. No beer at all. 
Yeah, he definitely had a rough night. Probably hung over or something worse. I knew what I had to do, even if I barely had the energy. It's not hard to dig up someone's past military record these days. All I wanted to know was if David's story held up, just that he was discharged honorably. If so, I'm all in to support him. If not, then... Damn. Realizing time was ticking, I had to hustle or I'd be late for work. Mom, Mrs. Camp Norris, was heading my way. Love that woman. She caught up with me as I was coming down the stairs. Michael, heard your brother's back, she said. Yeah, stopped by yesterday, I replied. She looked concerned, hinted with a nod toward my place. I got her drift. I grinned. No worries. Celine and I are solid, I assured her. She smiled back, but seemed unsure. That unnerved me a bit. Anyway, redoing this text under these rules means opting for simpler, more direct language while trying to evoke the same emotional weight and story progression. This version aims to keep the essence with a focus on accessibility and emotional depth. Well, I did what I had planned. Went to work, did my thing. Came home and saw Celine making dinner. My brother David was there, holding Sarah. That made me feel weird. I walked in. Hey, everyone, how's it going? Celine was trying to get some olive oil in a pan. She smiled. David's here for dinner. We're having eggs and bacon. That's when I saw the microwave running. The bacon was in there. I yelled to David, Is that your bike outside? Sold the car, got a bike. David yelled back, kissing Sarah. He looked happy, but I felt a bit worried about how he held her. The car he had just yesterday had Indiana plates. Selling a new Audi for an old bike didn't make sense. But David often didn't make sense. Nice bike, I said, not fully meaning it. He shouted back, Wanted one for ages, but with all the time at sea... In the Navy? I asked. Yeah, had to keep it stored most times, he said. Hey, Dave, I yelled. What was your job in the Navy? Missile stuff, on a frigate, he yelled back. I frowned. Thought you said you were on a carrier, the Ronald Reagan? Yeah, but got moved for my missile skills, he said. That felt off to me. I glanced at Celine. She messed up with the eggs, not like her. Need help? She was all smiles. Yes, please get the bacon. And can you do the eggs? I need to change Sarah. I went to the kitchen. Sure, love. Gave her a kiss and a playful tap as I passed. She swatted my hand, smiling, and headed to the living room. Stop that, Michael. David might find stuff in my house. I was done with one egg. It broke. I tried putting in more. They broke too. They say if eggs are super fresh, they break easy. I heard Celine and David leave the living area. They went to our room. I don't think David knew I could hear them. Their voices were soft. I heard him say he missed her. Then she said, I missed you too. We all did. He said he thought about her all the time. He could have written, he said. Celine softly said a letter now and then would have been nice. Then he spoke softly, saying he couldn't. After his basic training, they sent him to a secret school. It was all hush-hush, he explained. Celine quietly asked, like a secret? In a low voice, he answered, kind of. He can't talk about it. It's meant to be secret. I heard Celine again. I knew they didn't want me to know. Gino somehow knew. What he said next was unclear, but I caught parts. He mentioned his military files were sealed. No one's supposed to know his actions. He might have to go back. I missed some parts, but I knew enough. Even if I found something online, he could say it was fake to mislead people. This wasn't the Dave I knew, or maybe it was. The Dave that didn't care about school. The Dave who cared more about girls and other stuff. Yeah, Dave used to hang with bad crowds. He wasn't always perfect. I had cooked some more eggs and the second round of bacon was ready. I shouted, dinner's ready. Celine replied, coming. Soon we were all sitting at the kitchen table. Celine had our baby, Ciara, next to her. Ciara was happy and laughing. She was so pretty. I looked at Celine. She seemed so at home. Then I looked at Dave. He was looking at me. I saw it. Jealousy. He smiled warmly at Celine. You're lucky, he said. She looked lovingly at our baby, then at Dave. She didn't look at me. She smiled at my brother. I think so, she said. The tension was thick. Dave's return stirred emotions. Celine and I with our little family, and Dave with his secrets, all at one table. It felt like a scene out of a movie, where the past and present collide, leaving us to wonder what the future holds. I had to break the ice. Hey, Dave, you remember back in your last year of school when you lost your driving rights? I looked at him and then at Celine. 
I wasn't sure she knew this tale. Dave just muttered. I went on. You bought Gary Upton's old car but couldn't get it insured so no license plate was possible. Then you and a buddy went into the city to find a car with easy-to-copy plate numbers. You guys took the plate and changed the numbers a bit to use on your own car. And you only drove at night with it. He just nodded. Yeah, I recall. I kept going, noticing Celine was hearing this for the first time, her face showing clear disapproval. Do you also recall the 20 gallons of gas you stole and kept in your trunk? And when you thought you needed new tires, you and a friend found a car with nice ones. And late at night you tried to switch the tires, but in the dark, you couldn't find the tool to remove them. So you lit a match. By now, David was all tense, not touching his food. But yeah, that was ages ago. I couldn't stop. Man, they said the fire shot up 20 feet high. All the hair on your face was gone. Dad was so mad. Then Celine cut in. I thought you got those burns rescuing a lady from her burning car. That's what you told me. Dave then cut her off. I lied about the car and the lady. Dave began to shake. I need one of my... He looked at Celine. The green pills, please, from my bag. Celine's look went from curious to deeply caring for an old love. She hurried to get his medicine. While she was away, Dave stared at me. I don't need this from you, okay? I just grinned, lost in the past. She came back with the pills, handing them to my brother. His hands shook as he opened the bottle and took three pills out. After what I did in the Navy, I need these to keep calm. He looked at Celine. Thanks, love. She smiled at him, then gave me a look. You shouldn't talk about old high school times. That's long past. We were just kids. Yeah, I thought, just kids. My mind started to see it all clear. The so-called hero in front of me wasn't so perfect. Back then, I was too naive to see it. I glanced at my wife, still looking up to him. What was I to do? Dinner ended, and soon after Dave left, Celine had to head to work the next day. But I didn't. The kid's grandma and Chris would watch our little one. Celine and I planned to go to church in the morning. I'd hit the books in the afternoon while she worked hard. It was the end of winter, spring on its way. She being the boss meant more hours. We got the baby to sleep and went to bed. Celine came close and we held each other. I love you, I whispered. She hugged tighter. I love you too. Then she said, let's have another. I whispered back, give me a sec, honey. She pecked my cheek and said softly, no, I mean, let's have another kid. I wasn't in the mood anymore and sat up. You mean start on another one right now? She sat up too. Yeah, Sarah's still little. If we wait, she'll be older and they won't be as close. If we do it now, they'll grow up tight, not just in age, but in everything. I lay back, thinking. You may be right. I'll be done with school by Christmas. I think I've got something lined up. Your job's been great with Sarah and all. Let's look at our money in a few days. We should also talk to our folks, seeing they're our babysitters. She cuddled up to me. My mom's already hinted at it. I looked at our money books. Even if I didn't get work right away, she was making good money. We could handle it. Another kid? Why not? Why now? Why when Dave is back? No, Celine's not that sneaky. She wouldn't. I leaned over and kissed her soft cheek. Okay. When do we start? Celine got up quick. I'll take my diaphragm out now. Let me get ready. We start tonight. My excitement faded, but then it came back. And so did we. Then we slept. Then it was like a bad dream. All my worries and fears were real. We made it through Sunday. Celine had Monday off. I worked all day and had class Monday night. It was late winter, anything could happen. The weather lady said some rain or snow might come. It was very cold and the ground was hard. I was half to school when it began to rain and freeze. Then the man on the radio said classes were off. I stopped, turned my car to four-wheel drive as if it would help. I turned back home. When I got there, I parked and saw Dave's bike on the grass near our place. I thought he's here for sympathy. I went in, took off my wet shoes, and started up the stairs. Three quarters up, I heard them. No, this can't be. Celine and I had so much between us, all our plans and promises. I kept going up and into the kitchen, then the living room, to our bedroom. Sarah must be asleep. I heard everything Dave said to my wife. I'm so sorry. I never wrote. I missed you. I heard Celine whisper back, I love you, Dave, always have. God, you're so warm, your skin's so soft, you're sweet, I love your hair, 
Your lips are like flowers. I couldn't believe it. All that I loved about her, she was sharing with him. Then I heard her say, We can make it, Dave. We can. My heart broke. He did it. We can. I just can't leave him, said my wife. It would break my parents' hearts. But it's you, Dave. It's always been you. We can make it work. Then, he trusted you. Dave, I feel so bad. Michael trusts me a lot, but I still want your baby. What? The DNA? You two being brothers? He'll never know? I can't handle it. Enough, I shouted. No, I pushed the door open. I had to stop this wrong thing. Next, I heard was Celine. Michael, Michael, wake up. I tossed and turned. Nearly lost my dinner. I sat up. Celine was there, holding me. You must have had a bad dream. Wait here. I'll get you water. She looked at the baby's crib. Glad we didn't wake the baby. She put on her robe and went to the kitchen quietly. Sweat was all over me. It was just a dream. Thank God Celine was here. Here, sweetie, drink this. I took a sip and gave the glass back. She saw it was late. She pulled me close, her soft body close to me. Come here, love. Let me help. She ran her fingers through my hair. She kissed near my ear. It's okay. I'm here. I held her tight. Said nothing for a bit. Then, I love you, Celine, you know that? She kept stroking my hair. I know. And I love you, too. You're my hero, did you know that? I closed my eyes. I felt safe. It was just a bad dream. But the days and weeks turned into a real nightmare. David. Poor, ill David was always around. At my parents, around my wife, everywhere. He was right. Looking online showed no sign of him in the Navy or anything. But over time, with some clever moves and some cash, I found out one could dig up a lot about military stuff. I could, if I wanted, dig up info on any military ride from basic Humvees to detailed specs on the top tanks and big guns. Sure, some stuff was off-limits, but for someone just looking around, especially from a far-off country keen on making their own, it seemed all there. Yet, knowing how and actually making one were worlds apart. The real trick was the special medals you needed. Plus, finding folks who knew how to put it all together wasn't easy. Weapons weren't my thing, though. I was on a hunt about my brother and find out I did. He had never worn a uniform unless you count time in jail. Yep, he had a record. Nothing too bad. Just a string of small stuff, mainly dealing with drugs like coke and heroin. Just as I thought, my brother was hooked. I wasn't losing sleep over his drug mess. How he ended up there wasn't for me to fuss over. The tricky part was how to tell mom and dad, and even trickier, how to break it to Celine without her going into a shell. Some folks are doers. They see something and they jump into action. Then there are the worriers. They see trouble and they fret. They twist. They can't let go. Damn, that was me. The classic overthinker. And toss in a bit of fear and you've got my full picture. Celine, she's pure gold. Always has been. But she's got this soft heart. In another life, she would have been waving banners for justice. She's always out to save the world. Me, I'm a bit more laid back. Sure, I'll help someone in need. I might even teach them a thing or two. But after that, they're on their own. So David was in a bind. He needed help. But that didn't mean throwing more money at his problem. I had to talk to my brother, but I couldn't let mom, dad, or Celine catch wind of it. I managed to corner him one day at the local bar, underneath the buzz of the neon lights and the murmur of others lost in their own stories. I found him. There, in the dim corner, sat David, a shadow of the brother I once knew. The years and his choices had etched lines of hardship onto his face, a living testament to the battles fought and lost within the confines of his own mind. Our conversation was a dance around truths too painful to confront head-on, a careful negotiation between what needed to be said and what could be heard. The weight of his struggles was a tangible presence between us, a chasm that had grown over the years, filled with missed opportunities and regrets. As I looked into his eyes, I saw not just the brother who had lost his way, but also the boy who had once shared my dreams and fears. In that moment... I understood that our paths, though diverged, were still part of the same journey. My resolve hardened. I would not let the past define our future. With each word, I tried to bridge the gap, to offer not just help, but understanding and acceptance. I spoke of hope, of the possibility of change, and the strength I knew he possessed. And as the night wore on, a fragile connection was rekindled, 
a flicker of recognition in his eyes that told me he, too, yearned for redemption. As I left the tavern, the cool night air felt like a balm, soothing my troubled thoughts. The road ahead would not be easy, and the shadows of my brother's addiction would always linger at the edges. But within me surged a newfound determination, a vow to stand by him, to fight for him when he could not. And perhaps in that fight we would find our way back to each other, two brothers bound not just by blood but by a shared hope for a brighter tomorrow. He was tucked away in the corner with his usual crew spouting nonsense. I pulled him aside. Hey Dave, need a word? He shot his friends a look, the kind that screams they're lost without me, but agreed and followed me to a secluded booth. We sat. Dave, listen to me. But he cut in, yeah, what about? I got straight with him. Don't play dumb. I'm on to you. And he's like, what's dumb supposed to mean? I was half annoyed because I thought he knew better, but also because he was obviously playing dumb about my choice of words. I spelled it out. It means you don't care about anything. You're just a big talker who's never really done anything except mess up, get in trouble, and land in jail. Honestly, I'm surprised those three strikes laws haven't caught up with you yet. He just rocked back, laughing, then leaned in close. Listen here, little bro, he sneered. Been snooping around, huh? Well, guess what? Screw you, and your wife, too. That hit me hard. What's that supposed to mean? I shot back. He grinned. I was with her way before you. She was easy in high school, and guess what? I'm gonna be with her again. That claim? He never touched her in high school. And I knew that for sure. But what bothered me was the thought she still had a soft spot for this jerk. And with her always wanting to help, he might just get his chance. If that happened, I knew what I'd do. I'd end him. And yeah, I'd have to walk away from her too. I stared him down hard. You need to go. If you do, I won't spill to mom and dad. I won't shatter Celine's innocent dreams. But you gotta leave. He just glared. Or what? They'd never take your word over mine. In this brew of emotional chaos, with my words blunt and stripped to their bones, I saw the flicker of something in his eyes. Maybe fear. Maybe defiance. But the point was clear as day. This was a line drawn. A battle of wills set against the backdrop of tangled pasts and uncertain futures. Mom and Dad think I got sick from my time in the army. And Celine, Damn that fool. She still loves me. She picked you because you were next in line. I just need to click my fingers. Just like that. I snap my fingers and she's in my bed, ready for me. I wanted to hit David right there, but that wouldn't fix anything. It would just get me in trouble. Knowing David, who was once my brother, he'd play the victim. He could even get me arrested and sue me. I was stuck, not knowing what to do. I took a step back. David, you're my brother. I remember the good times growing up. Don't ruin those memories. Don't mess things up for mom and dad. Celine doesn't need this. Do us a favor and go. Just make up a reason and leave. He stood up. I'll leave after I've been with your wife, not before. He left and went through the door. Things were getting messy. Celine was busy with work, and our moms were helping with Sierra when I was working or at school. Celine and I wanted another baby, and around Thanksgiving, Celine missed her period, so it seemed we'd have a baby by late spring. What worried me was David being around while I was busy. The guy was persistent. Then, when Celine started to look pregnant, I wondered if the baby was mine this time. And after Thanksgiving, Mom and Dad started acting strange. It felt like they were keeping something from me. I worried Celine had been with my brother. My parents knew and were trying to shield me. That scared me even more. David had always been overly confident, but recently he was acting even more arrogant. That was deeply troubling. Maybe I was too quick to feel, but Celine seemed off lately. It felt like a layer of secrets hid behind her words and actions. But our chats about a new baby, our shared love for Sarah, and our moments in bed felt right. Yet even in bed something was amiss. We had always matched perfectly when it came to lovemaking. We both enjoyed the build-up and the traditional way of it. There was something about the simple missionary style we both found joy in. We talked about it once, how it felt like it was just us in our own world, safe in our bubble. But now I was scared, scared that my brother would ruin everything. I couldn't stand him and I was mad at myself for feeling so powerless. I wanted to trust Celine and I did, but fear gnawed at me. And her recent behavior in bed didn't help. She'd been more eager, asking for more love than before. Why? 
Was I missing something? I'd looked into signs of cheating. When a woman becomes more loving, it could mean many things. Two were fear and guilt. God, did she fall for my brother? I couldn't shake off the thought. My brother's smooth talk must have tricked her. He had weaseled his way into our life, turning my fears into reality. And my parents, they must have known and were scared too. In a simpler way, it felt like something was wrong with Celine. She seemed to hide things with her actions and words. Only times that felt right were when we talked about having a kid, our love for Sarah, and our close moments. But even those felt strange lately. We clicked well in our intimacy. Both of us loved the lead-up and the simplicity of being close. We once shared how it was like being in a world of our own, just us, no one else, which was special. But my fear was about my brother breaking this special bond. I loathed him and hated feeling so stuck. Despite my fears, I wanted to believe in Celine, but I couldn't help feeling scared. Her recent need for more love made me wonder, was I overthinking? Reading about signs of cheating, more affection could mean fear or guilt. Damn. Was she with my brother? The thought haunted me. Maybe my brother's charm had fooled her. He had slipped into our life, making my nightmares come true. And my folks, they probably knew and felt afraid too. In my worst dream, it felt like a dark beast was ready to take down all I loved. I had to act, just like in the dream. I skipped my class and went home early only to find my brother with my wife. I was stuck in a scene straight from an old movie. I had no other choice but to dig deeper. So I started skipping more classes. I was sneaky about it, making sure my teachers were okay with it. I told them about needing to look after our baby. They understood. By that time, my brother traded his bike for a car, vanished for a few days, and came back with another high-end ride. This one was a Lexus with Pennsylvania plates. Before, he had one from Indiana, but I didn't know much about their rules. This time, I knew more and thought he might have stolen it. I kept quiet, though. I pondered what got into him. I knew about the troubles cocaine could cause. A nice guy could turn into someone you can't trust. I wondered, was it my fault? Should I have stepped in? Especially since he was creeping around my wife, yeah, I probably should have. I had already skipped three classes without catching them. On my fourth try, there it was. I always feared this day would come, even though part of me hoped it wouldn't. But there, right in my parking spot, was David's Lexus. I looked around the office spots and theirs was nowhere. Not hidden, not on the street. Then it hit me, it was Thursday and sometimes they go to the Masonic Lodge on Thursdays. Yes, my father-in-law was part of a builder's group. He wanted me to join too. My brother was in my apartment, upstairs with my wife. My little girl was there as well. This was the moment I had to find out the truth. I had no idea how I'd react if I discovered something awful, but knowing was a must. I left my beat-up car and sneaked into the house through the unlocked door. I slipped off my shoes and moved quietly up the stairs, facing my biggest fear. I was close to crying. Could my wife be betraying our dreams and hopes? I couldn't even fully think about it. I reached the top step and gently opened the door to our kitchen. Our small living room was between me and the bedroom, and the bedroom door was open. From what I've read, this was the point when I should start hearing noises of betrayal, the typical betraying sounds. I tiptoed through the kitchen. Then I realized they were in the living room, of all places. I stepped back, hesitating, then moved towards the stairs. I could still hear them, just a bit softer. My whole world was shifting. They must have been on the couch. My timing was terribly perfect. David's voice came first. You know I love you, and you love me too, right? Celine's reply shook me. Yes, I do love you, more than you can imagine. My throat tightened. My lips felt dry. I had to keep listening. From David, Then why can't we make this mean more? We just need to go back there. I assumed he meant our bedroom. We can, she responded. My heart almost stopped when Celine added, David, I've loved you since we were kids. I've always dreamed about this, she confessed. David gently insisted, It's not too late. We can make it real. Then Celine hesitated. David, things have changed now. But he cut in. Sure, there's Michael. He won't get hurt. He'll never find out. I was here before him. This rewriting simplifies the language and ensures a smooth, emotionally charged narrative, keeping the story accessible and engaging. My heart jumped. Did he really win her back in high school? 
Then I heard Celine talk. You were my first love, David, but I was holding back. That's why I couldn't be with you, he said. I would have stayed. But, she whispered, if only you had stayed. But you didn't. I went to your folks. I waited. I hoped. But then, my brother asked, you didn't fall for the kid, did you? Then Celine said things I never thought she would. It was simple, David. Michael was so kind, so sweet, so pure. I saw how he liked me. I saw his feelings grow. It happened to me, too. David, how can I explain? Yes, I loved you. Yes, I missed you. But then... Then it shifted. I no longer went to see your folks for you. I went there for Michael. Talk about a fresh start. I could hear my brother's plea. But I would have returned. I wanted to. David, I heard wife. It wouldn't have changed a thing. Michael was. He is. He became my hero. Girls have their dreams. I don't know what to say. I'll always care for you, David, but it's not the same. You were like a fantasy, a dream lost, a vision, lost in fog. Michael was real. He was good to me. He cared. I could see it in his eyes. I heard it every time he spoke to me. I felt it in his touch, the way he held me. He loved me. And one day I looked around and wondered, what did I ever see in you? You were fake gold. Michael was. No. Michael is the real gold. He's my everything. He's the father of my baby, my hero, my love, my friend, my all. David, can't you see? I adore that kid, as you call him. You want me to turn my back on that? I could never. David, I love Michael. I caught his final breath. But Celine, I heard her last say, I think it's time for you to go. Alabama, there are angels here. There are angels here. And I married one. I quietly shut the upstairs door. I sneaked down the stairs, grabbed my shoes, ran to my car, and drove off before anyone could see me. I drove to college, late again. Missed a lot, but no big deal. Cooked up a story about my babysitter being late. No one doubted me. I stayed till the class ended, then headed home. Celine and I had been arguing over names for our baby on the way. She's Italian, and our first kid, Sarah, got an Italian name. But I'm Sullivan, with Irish roots, and I wanted this time to lean into that. Celine and me, we weren't seeing eye to eye. On my way back, I stopped at Walmart, picked up some flowers to smooth things over. At home, I found Celine holding Sarah. I showed her the flowers, trying to bridge our little gap. I've been thinking about the baby's name, I began. She cut me off. Me too. I'm warming up to Maureen like Maureen O'Hara for a girl, for a boy, maybe Connor. I was floored. So, we're going Irish this time, I asked, sinking into a kitchen chair. Yes, she confirmed. Italian for number three. I got up for a drink of water, feeling halfway between stunned and relieved. All right, darling, if that's what you want. Celine just smiled, bouncing Sarah on her lap. That settled it. Later in a coffee shop, Devin looked puzzled. Why are you here, not at home? I smiled, stirring my coffee. Got an interview lined up. Celine's meeting me soon for some shopping ahead of baby number two. She's seven months in, can't carry stuff. So, things are cool between you two? Devin asked. Very, I assured him. Devin's smile matched mine. Glad to hear. And the thing with Tommy? That's all good now? I leaned back. Yeah, Devin. When Tommy appeared again, he told me about that night, how they'd messed with Celine. That night at Bear Creek? Turns out it was all a bad scene. I glanced away, the weight of that memory pressing down. Devin nodded, somber now. Tough stuff, man. Yeah, I agreed. But we're past it, looking ahead. And with that, the talk shifted to lighter topics, the heavy past gradually fading behind us as we planned for the future. He took her for a ride in his car. When he began to make a move on her, she woke up to what was happening. He was already moving forward when she started to cry and scream. Then, she hit him hard. Next, she jumped out of the car, grabbing her clothes as she left. He said she kept crying. She was waiting for someone special, but he didn't catch who. Tommy was so worked up, things ended right there just as she left. That probably explains the stain I saw, Devin. Their stories didn't match up perfectly, but I'd be more worried if they did. Did she get him to spill the beans to me? I'll never find out, and I don't really want to. What point would there be? Was she untouched when we married? No, because we had been together before that night. Was I the first? I believe so. But does it really count in the end? David never had a chance with her. I doubt Tommy did either. There weren't many others, if any at all. 
But here's what I'm certain of. She's the only one I'll ever need or want. What freaks me out is thinking about if she had chosen to be a nun. Then I'd have missed my shot. Devin just nodded. So did you ever tell her you knew about her chat with your brother? No. Why would I? If I did, I'd have to admit I skipped classes to spy on her with David. She would have known I had my doubts. You know, Devin, trust is something delicate. It's this rare thing. Once it's damaged or stained, you can't fully fix it. If she knew I had doubts, she might start doubting me. Man, Devin, I've been with a few others. She knows some of them. And I'm around some really attractive classmates. What if my boss was a looker? What I'm really saying is, I love my wife. Knowing she chose me felt great, but how I found out would have only hurt her. Celine and I have a beautiful daughter and another on the way. It's her life, her body, not just mine. Things are shifting. She's shy and scared enough as it is. She doesn't need any nonsense from me. I love her. She's my girl, my heart. No, something like that would only wound her. And there's another thing, too. Devin. What is it, Mike? I've started to trust. Yes, she's not flawless. But who is? I trust her. It was dumb of me not to before. You see, we shouldn't fret about things that likely never happened. Do you catch my drift? My doubts, my mistrust, they were just echoes of my own fears. And to me, that's just silly. Damn it, she trusts me too. Just then, I saw my phone light up on the table. That's her. Devin. I'll be off then. As I stood to leave, Devin said, Hey, whatever became of your brother? I paused. David. He took off a few days after he met with Celine. No one knows where he's gone, and frankly, I don't much care. All I know is I've got everything I ever wanted, and they're all waiting for me outside in the car. I waved. Catch you later. Expanding on that, warmth spread through me as I pushed through the doorway, the cool evening air wrapping around me like a familiar embrace. My heart felt light, a stark contrast to the heavy burdens I'd carried before, the misunderstandings, the fears, all dissolved into the twilight. Walking towards the car, I couldn't help but think about the journey it took to get here, learning to let go of insecurities, embracing trust, not just in words, but through actions, through the quiet moments and the stormy ones. It struck me then how profound love can be, transforming doubts into trust, fear into courage. The car door opened, and there she was, my beacon in any storm, her smile the kind that could end wars in my heart. This moment, these realizations, felt like stepping into a new chapter, one where trust wasn't just a word tossed around, but a foundation we built, brick by emotional brick. Ready? she asked, her voice breaking through my reverie. More than ever, I thought, but instead I simply nodded, taking her hand in mine. As we drove off, leaving Devon and the remnants of old fears behind, I realized that this, the simmering peace, the shared silences, the laughter filling the gaps, was everything I'd ever wanted. The road stretched ahead, unwritten, promising, with the night sky watching over us, a silent witness to this simple yet profound truth. Love, built on trust, knows no boundaries. And in that moment, I was infinitely grateful for the journey, for her, and for the lessons along the way. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed watching this video and want to stay updated with our latest content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video with Queen Cheating Tales.